Hello and welcome to the California Wealth Warrior Podcast with Ray Almo. If you live in California or you're thinking about living in California and you don't want to leave it because it's such a beautiful place, this is your podcast because Ray is here to tell you how to protect your money and how to protect your wealth and stay in the Golden State. Ray, how are you, my friend? Good to see you. I am phenomenal. I had a, a little little hiccup at the beginning of the year. This this little annoying thing called COVID. Ah. Try to get try to get to our family, and uh, we fended it off. But now uh, now we're we'll chalk that up to done with the rest of the year. Now we can be healthy and and exactly. uh, productive. It's my idea. Get the sickness out of the way early. Boost the immune system. Immune system and get going. That's that's, exactly. a, that's a good attitude. Yeah. What yeah. Have we got going on today? Well. We're gonna we're gonna continually do building blocks, and we're gonna s- start stacking up these great tools that I've known for and I've accumulated for thirty plus years, and great people. We're gonna introduce you to to one today, and it, we're gonna always pick up where I leave off on the prior podcast. So the listeners should say, okay, if if you were to log into episode twenty five. And you hear about something, it, you it's probably smart to think, hey, they're they're referencing something that was previous, and maybe I should go listen to episode twenty four, yeah. and maybe I should go listen to, or better yet, maybe I should go back to number one. It started <laughs> right. number one and kind of move your way forward. Exactly right. So, so the the point is, it's methodical. Um, you you, you everybody that knows me knows I'm OCD in a good way. And I think in terms of Excel spreadsheet. And so everything's done in order and and, and we want to do that. And, and the reason is for that, for the listener and the Californian uh, I referenced earlier, things are so overwhelming and so confusing when they're coming at you, you don't know where to plug them in. Okay. You mm-hmm. don't know how ev- the puzzle fits together and it gets so overwhelming that you freeze. And so if we can go back to basics on creating the house, the foundation, the walls, the roof, right, and, and, and build that, then people have a, a a better grasp and controllability to apply their world. And yeah. So at any rate, what we're going to do today is is uh, we're going to talk, you know, trust CFO. We always talk about trust. That's really the the the, the raising the bar from zero dimension of protection. Okay, in tax planning to one with basic level with a, a, a corporation and, and then two and three with trust. And I, I discussed that methodology. Okay. So with that, we now are going to hone in on business entities because these things have have a certain perception. And clients think that they're going to cure everything. And then they get flustered and, and, and can't figure out why they're not. And so what I'm doing today is I'm going to introduce a good friend of mine, Ed Cotney of Olympus Tax. And Ed is, uh, gosh, we've known each other through some mutual friends and God bless him. We lost our mutual friend, Dave Schaefer recently, rest in peace. Um, And Ed is always been there for us for a, a corporate structuring support. So Ed, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, good morning, Ray and Bill. Pleasure to be here with you. So um, Eddie here is um, been in the business as long as I have. Um, we, we've we've always been spinning around doing things, even though uh, we take it from two different entryways, and then we often find we converge. And so, again, where I'm on the trust administration side, uh, Ed's coming in there and, and fixing from the corporate entity structuring side, and yet those two have to talk to each other. So what you're going to find is that the business entities that I'm going to I'm going to help Ed discuss and uh, illuminate on today is going to be tied into trust. So let me actually um, start there to set the stage. And then I'm going to kind of peel back a little bit. And I'm going to let uh, Ed grab the bull by the horns and start uh, doing the building blocks for this for our listeners. Okay. That sound good, Ed? Yes, sir. Okay. So it, before we talked about uh Trusts and trusts have the highest level of protection, the highest level of, of, of tax ability planning. But again, they can get confusing. So in these trusts, 
you don't just fund assets per se, okay? So if I have real estate, do I just go put it in a trust? Uh, if I have an investment portfolio, just go put it in a trust, you know? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use our baseline trust that I referred to. It's the easiest one to discuss. Um, it's the California Private Retirement Plan Trust, and it, it's the safest, strongest, most profitable, and it is pro-entity. And so again, if I were to put real estate into a trust, the problem is the the trust is owns it and the trustee is managing it. And yet it's the client that is good at managing the asset. So the whole purpose of an entity is to create the opportunity to, do, to uh, um, dissect two major roles, the role of management to the role of equity, the paper, the stock. So we're looking at a corporation, you have a shareholders agreement, you have shares, and you have shareholders, okay? They own what? Stock, the paper, that's the equity. If you own the equity, it doesn't mean you need to be the manager. You could own the equity of a company and be sitting on the beach and you could have management, CEOs, presidents, et cetera, secretaries managing the company. Um, on, the, on the other spectrum, you have LLCs, which are very prominent and they're very pro private retirement plan. And I'll explain that. And you have the dissection of what these were intended to do. Manageability. You have a manager and you have members. And the members own that paper. It's not a stock. It's a member interest. There's a little bit of difference. But you also have that management role. Okay. So they can be dissected. So why do I go through this? Many, many people don't know that. I literally talked to them. I was with a client two days ago. Has an LLC for multiple par parcels of real estate in each state. Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, and an LLC. He's both manager and the member and his wife. And there's little benefit to doing that. He could have had it in his name and doing that. Okay. The theory was, oh, I've got protection. But when you look at those things, you look at the name, limited liability, not no liability, limited liability. So it's not that I can't sue a corporation or can't sue an LLC. You can. And the problem there is, you're still dealing with litigation. You're still bleeding to death and legal fees. You're stuck in a courtroom and you have many, many sleepless nights. Okay. So that, that's, that's the stage of entities at a one dimension and our clients can get frustrated when they, when they call in, they say, Hey, you know, um, I've got this corporation, I'm protected. And I go, are you? Oh, uh, I don't know. Okay. Well, it, you ever heard of the term inside outside liability? Can I sue the corp, well, yeah, if something that happened inside that entity, that corporate veil, is caused the issue. The idea is meant to have that veil to protect what's inside that bucket to what's outside the bucket on your estate balance sheet. Same with LLCs. The problem is, again, the, the people I know and the Ed, Ed know, the attorneys, can get through those things quite easily and, and cause problems. So what we want to do is we want to say, what if we have the stock Okay. And what is, what is that entity for? The entity just man it assets and the assets are for retirement. And what if we fund that to a private retirement plan trust that's now exempt? There's a big difference. And I talked about exemption, okay, which is protection versus maybe protection of limited liability. Um, so the problem is the entity assets in there are often inefficient and a client gets frustrated. They go, Hey, you know, I've got a S corp, but uh, I'm bleeding to death. And my CPA is just giving me, you know, the damage report. And it's because the distributions of, of member interest and the, um, uh, the dividends of corporate shares are just passing right on through. And so what we're going to do today is talk about how that entity structuring can create a net, if you will, inside the trust before it flows out, and you have no recourse because once you get it, you're gonna you're gonna pay the tax and the damage. So that's that's my setting the stage, and and I'm gonna let uh, Ed maybe clarify some points if I if that need be, and then um, he can kind of grab onto this. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply it to certain scenarios. Okay, we're gonna talk about you know active business, passive business like real estate, um, uh, even estate planning and charitable. Right, Ed. So with that, I will shut up. And I will uh, let the guru 
Um, let me, you know, uh, Ed is is a national speaker. He's often called on uh, many, many forums, CPA forums, advisor forums, and he speaks on these things. And I would guess, Ed, that you probably get a few gold nuggets in those meetings, um, but probably not everybody, because again, at the end of the day, sometimes this is above some of the pay grades, or it just doesn't fit their agenda. And that's okay. Um, what it does fit is my agenda. And my agenda is Californians are going to have to fight tooth and nail to survive here. They cannot do it on the mundane 101 planning that they've told them, set up a corp and you're done. It ain't going to happen. So- what do you say? <laughs> you know, Ray, it's ex you're exactly right. Um, the business owner out there, they typically start off with day one. We've got a nickel. We get money from friends and family. We start in a garage. We we slowly start building up a business. Uh, somebody will say, hey, you need to set up a business entity. The most common is typically an escort for an operating business, LLCs for passive assets like real estate. And, and they just keep growing. And, and typically what happens is that business owner, through the process of building the value of their business, increasing EBITDA, hiring employees, expansions, et cetera, they just keep going and they also keep building their personal income and their personal wealth. And they just quickly go through what we call the progressive tax ladder. In other words, if you make 50,000 bucks a year, you're in a really low tax bracket state and federal versus if you make a million dollars a year, you're in a high tax bracket state and federal. And here in California, uh, you and I talked about a case I had last year where a husband and wife were just so done with, with the 13.3% tax because they were over the million dollar mark, which is California has the millionaire tax at 1%. Uh, they had decided to take matters into their own hands. Uh, their CPA could not give them any help. They'd already deducted everything possible. They expensed everything. that It was a compliant tax return. And uh, they decided, you know, we're just going to go ahead and set up residence in another state that has no state income tax. And uh, but we're going to continue operations in California, but we're going to buy a house there. We're going to get some cars there. We're going to change our driver's license there. And for the purposes of reporting who we are and where we live, we're going to be in that other state. But we're going to keep making money in California. And, and I'm sitting there scratching my head going, how the heck do you think that California is not going to catch this? And they're like, we're just not going to do this. We're going to fire the CPA we have in California. We're going to hire a new CPA in this other state. And we're just going to start reporting all of our income is, is flowing through to the corporation in the new state. And uh, even though they have millions of dollars of revenue in California. And I'm like, you have done all this to, to change your lifestyle, to somehow mitigate a California 13% tax rate, exposing yourself to potential huge issues, uh, which by the way, California will normally catch this at some point soon. Uh, I said, you're doing all this just because you, you're, you don't like being in a 51, 52% total tax rate. And they're like, yeah, I mean, you're the tax guy. You're supposed to know the pain. I'm like, yeah, I know the pain, but there's an <laughs> easier way for us to help you address these issues. If you just don't like being in a 51, 52% tax rate, Maybe you need to be talking to other people about how to play the tax game. Yeah. So what what, what you're saying, this is important, is that, um, again, when you have limited resources and, and they're, they're working within their current box, what they're doing is they're stretching the box and they're creating risk because that's all they know. And, and, and they're creating a dangerous situation, trying to skirt, okay, and, and try to say, I don't want to play the rules of the game. When all they need to do is they need to jump over the fence and play with the different set of rules that empower them to do so. So with that, yeah, continue. Exactly. And basically, they were the typical example of a mom and pop operation that started out literally in the backyard and they just grew and grew and they outgrew their CPA. That's typically the crux of what their initial issue was. Great CPA knows how to file a compliant tax return. Here's all my numbers. They go into forms. They, they did a great job of a compliant tax return, but from a tax mitigation perspective, the CPA couldn't really provide them any value in respect to how do we get them to a lower tax rate. And, you know, you talked about business entity formations. Uh, another thing that I see happen a lot when we have that new business owner two, three, five years down the road and their numbers are just going through the roof, uh, they'll start out on the cheap where they won't ask the attorney or CPA for advice on how to set up their business entity. 
And so they'll go online, they'll find some legal place that will do something online, or they'll just do it themselves over the counter, mail it into the Secretary of State's office. And they just go, well, I saw on the internet, I should be an LLC or an S Corp or whatever. Uh, practically every state has what's called a business and professions code, which outlines if you're going to be a beautician, or if you're going to be an architect, or if you're going to be a physician or a building contractor, these are the entities that we will allow you to be. Now, here's what's said. Joe Consumer can decide he wants to be an S-Corp, C-Corp, LLC, partnership, whatever, file for that business entity in the state. The state will not stop you from filing improperly. They will stamp that puppy, send it out the door, and you might be in one of those professions where the state says you can't be this, but you can be this. The state will not stop you from illegally forming yourself as a business entity that you should not be. And you will go for years. Yeah, I'm an LLC. I'm an LLC. And the business and profession codes doesn't allow you to be an LLC. And the next thing you know, you have a litigation event like you're talking about. You have no asset protection at all here. You're going to be spending big money on litigation defense because at the very beginning, your formation structures did not align with state approved business and profession codes. Even though you thought you were correct, your CPA probably missed it, even though you finally have a CPA. Nobody ever stopped to ask the question. And I get this question at least once a month where somebody says, hey, we're such and such, such and such in this state. And I'm like, what does your business and profession code said? What do your lawyer said when you set up the business entity? And they'll go, we didn't use a lawyer. We just did this ourselves. We saved a couple of thousand dollars and here we are. And it is just crazy about that. And the reason you and I get along so well, and even in my first book, I talk about rule number one, protect your assets. Because if you don't protect your assets, you don't have to wear a tax issues anymore because <laughs> if you lose all your stuff in a lawsuit, you don't have a tax problem. Yeah. I brought that up in the first one is, is that they tie together. If you succeed on one and fail on the other, it's all for naught, right? Um, so let's let's do this to enlighten our, our the clients, um, the pro, you know the the people out there um, with their advisors. And, and I guess what we're also saying is, listen, if you're if you're hearing this and you're not sure, you need to ask. Okay, it, it, you don't ask, don't get. And so you need to confront any advisors that you have. And a they they must be proactive. If they're not proactive, and I know plenty of CPAs that say. Nope, just, you know, here's here's what you need to do. Just have this business entity. And and you're just going to bleed to death. It's that simple. I hate, I hate to be an ass about it, but that's the way it is. And and so you need to ask them, what can I do structurally to change, to improve? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the stage for Ed to be that proactive guy. Let's role play, Ed. Okay. Because again, let's just skip over the, the CPA that says you, you're doing as much as you can. I've expensed everything I can. And you're just going to have to stick to pay the, the $500,000 tax bill that's come on April 15th. Right. Um, and your, and your estimates. And I'm going to tell you guys out there, if you're listening, th that, that is just BS. Okay. I've got no mercy for it. I got no tolerance for it. Okay. In my, in my mature age, um, Ed's a little kinder. He just shakes his head and says, uh, Ray, we need to talk to these people. <laughs> so <laughs> at any rate, um, Ed, so I'm a small business owner and I've got this 101 thinking that I've ever been taught. And, and, and listen, I'll give I'll give those people credit again through their growth curve. They started with nothing. They were maybe a sole prop, right? I actually met a sole prop a couple of weeks ago and I was like astounded um, and they were doing quite well. So um Somebody said you need to be court incorporated for some menial tax benefits and you need to have your revocable living trust, which the myth is, oh, I'm protected in trust. No, it has zero ass protection. So now let's take it to they've outgrown that. And they're, they're, they're and as you know, our clients go through stages. It, it, if they get to 10 million, they're not done. OK, there's a there's a, a ceiling between 10 and 20 and 20 and 40 and so forth and so on. And the growth curve on that is you you're you're disarmed or, or the, the current planning is is weakened substantially and providing very little value and you have to upgrade it's like buying your laptop computer every couple of years and upgrading your ram right so 
if, if I'm one dimensional, I've got one business entity, let's say I have real estate and I was told I need an LLC for my passive investment. So we have one active company driving active income and earnings. Okay. And we can talk about, I want to talk about that first. And then we'll talk about the passive because they're two different worlds and the two different structures. So Ed, go, let's talk about the, the corporation. Let's say I'm making, uh, let's pick 2 million per year taxable net profits. <clears throat> All right, so let's go with a sole shareholder operating as an S corporation um, in California, making two million of profits that are W two K one bonus whatever. That means two million dollars after every miracle known to man has been done lands on the shareholders ten forty, their IRS form ten forty, which we all know quite well, and pretty much what I see most Americans do is the CPA says we've got your your tax report done, uh, sign here, mail a check by this date. Here's the coupon. Most and then, and, then, and then you go home and you scream into your pillow all night. Yeah. And and the sad thing is most most people don't even look at the tax return. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, and I'll ask them, hey, let's walk through your tax return. They're like, that'd be great. I'm like, you mean your CPA doesn't do this with you? No, they send it over electronically. Uh so it is worth you sitting down with your CPA doing things. But the typical person making two million a year, and, and in California, you're going to be flirting with 50, 52% total tax on that, depending on the source of the income. But let's just say it's all ordinary. Uh, it, at a $2 million of income hitting on your 1040, you're looking at a $900,000 tax bill, plus or minus 50, uh, pretty easily. And so the question becomes, I made $2 million, I have $1.1 1 .1 left over. Um, it, it, do you live on $1.1? .1? And so for that, that consumer shareholder, who makes two million a year, pays 900 in tax, has 1.1 in her bank account. If they're consuming all $1.1 million and spending it on gambling or buying new Maseratis every other <laughs> year or whatever, if you're consuming the entire $1.1 million, you probably need to call Dave Ramsey or Susie Ormond and ask for some budgeting advice. Okay. Yeah. But that's a budget problem. It's a budget problem. Yeah, we can't help you. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, uh, there's not a lot of help you can do here. But if you're that business owner who has been successful and you're trying to grow your business, you're trying to grow your personal wealth, you're thinking about maybe living and retiring, you know, if you're planning on dying in a year or two, you can just go ahead and tone out because there's nothing you can do in just a year to solve your tax bill significantly. But if you're planning on living and retiring well, uh, you got to think about the the return on the yield. I mean, if you have a hundred thousand dollar tax savings event, what is the lifetime yield on a hundred thousand dollars that you were able to keep control of? And you know, you mentioned control earlier, Ray. I, I love the things that that Warren Buffett writes about, and one of the things that just just is fantastic is is he's got a comment in one of his books that says, "I want to control everything." but I want to own as little as possible. And, and there is great wisdom in that. But for most business owners, they have a hard time getting to the point of understanding what that really means. And you get it because of the way you guys structure asset protection. So for that, that business owner making $2 million a year, paying $900 in tax, let's say this business owner is living on $500,000 to pay both his personal tax and his consumption that means he or she has $600,000 of excess income landing on their tax return. So one of the terms you'll hear me use when I lecture is called income stacking. And so when you look at the tax code, it's got these brackets. You make this much, you're in 12, this much, 15, you know, 24, 32, 37. When you start looking at the income stacking part of it, if, if you could live at the federal 24% tax rate, which is just short of $400,000 for, for a single, you know, for, for married couple filing, you know, uh, jointly. If you're living in a low tax bracket, like 24% federally, but you're making two million a year having to pay tax at 37% federal, plus a few more percentage points in there for Obama tax, then is there a way that you could restructure the manner in which you're earning money so that the money that is landing on your 1040 is only taxed at the 24% tax rate because you're only needing to consume, you know, roughly $400,000 and then have the extra monies between the 400,000 and 1.1 structure that in such a way that maybe it's going to be taxed at a low rate too. For example, a C-Corp, 
A C Corp federal tax rate is at 21%. And I know every one of you right now are going, oh my gosh, my CPA has told me C Corps are double tax. That's false. C Corps are triple tax. Triple tax. Here's the problem with mentality of people hearing the word tax. I don't care if it's quadruple tax. The issue becomes, is my planning structure in such a manner that I can have, keep, and control more wealth regardless of the layers of tax that my business structure provides? And so you have to think about that for a minute. And people go, well, Ed, S-Corp is only one layer of tax. No, it's not. It's two. It's federal and state. So S-Corps are double tax if you live in California. C-Corps are triple tax if you live in almost, you know, definitely California. But again, it gets back to that issue of asset protection, number one. Number two, tax planning. And so if I'm at a 21% federal rate for my C-Corporation at 21%, if I'm in a 37 or 40% tax rate, there's a huge arbitrage right there. And remember the key thing here are my earnings greater than my consumption? So if I'm earning two, paying 900 in tax, and I'm living on four-ish, maybe five, clearly there's a tax arbitrage between the normal and S-corp tax rate versus a C-corp tax rate, even in blood-sucking tax states like California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, there's an arbitrage that happens for people that are frankly too successful. And so if you wanna pay less tax, Quit being successful. Just earn a little bit of money and stay at the house. You know, if you like driving that Malibu from Chevrolet or something like that, and you just want to get a new car every 10 years, stay in S Corp, earn two or 300,000 bucks a year and be happy. But for those of you who either on purpose or by accident, start making a million, two million, five million a year, you may have outgrown your tax structure and your tax planning and depending on what your business model is about, if it's to grow your EBITDA, if it's to expand the business, to grow the equity values, you have to start asking multiple people, how do we approach this thing? Because if you could save one, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year in taxation with asset protection, just so that you can control more wealth to grow your business faster, you have to start asking the right people the right questions. And that's what's really sad, Ray, and you and I see this all the time. Well, I've had my CPA for 22 years. We were college roommates together. We go to the same church. We shoot at the same hunting club. Uh, that's great. The, the, the one I get is, hey, my dad and my grandfather used him. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, is he 85 years old? You know, and no, again, no, everybody is earned the right and they've, they, they've got a profession. Uh, audience we're just trying to match you got to get matched up with somebody that can raise you up they got to raise you up and that's that's all i've ever done hanging out with the guys like ed and everybody else you're going to meet so um yeah ed this the the, the uh the c corp um is really a a awesome structure for us specifically but let's just make a statement that the c corp stock not only is heavily more protected, but we can also fund it as the retirement asset for inside the private retirement plan trust. So it's got a belts and suspenders, double layer of protection. So that's actually solved quite easily, frankly. But then now internally within the trust, we have now this ability to start managing the taxation. And I want to talk about a little bit further about that with some other things there too. Like if you have an active business, let's talk about debt, debt management. You know, it, it's as we grow our businesses, you know, we always have this idea that, you know, I'm going to need another building. And I get this case all the time. Ed, you know, we're successful, we're making good money. And then we start looking at some of the tax mitigation issues. And then we start talking about what are your plans going forward? Well, we need a 30,000 square foot building. Our business is growing. You know, we're just going to run down to the bank and, and borrow a bunch of money, maybe SBA, whatever. And uh, we're going to put, you know, X amount of money down and the payments are going to be this. And just let me kind of put this in perspective. And it just blows my mind. And, and there is some timing, combining and sequencing steps here. But just for the purposes of a podcast and we don't have a video to work with. If I'm an S corporation in the max tax bracket and I run down to the bank to borrow one point two million dollars because I need to buy a piece of real estate and some equipment. I mean, almost everybody does this with their business, but I'm going to go borrow $1.2 million. 
and I'm just going to do a standard loan. And so I do a 25-year loan with the bank. They set up the payment plan. I'm the guarantor of this loan, whether no matter what my business is, I'm the person that's going to buy an asset that's going to be held as security for the loan. This None of that changes, okay? As an S-Corp, if I'm in the 40% tax rate, and remember here in California, this is even more powerful, but I'm just using 40% just so people go, well, I live in Nevada. We don't have state taxes. C calm down. I'm in the 40% tax rate, 3% Obama tax and change. I borrow $1.2 million in an S-Corp type tax scenario. I have to earn $1.69 in order to have a dollar left over to service that debt. So when I earn a dollar, because the bank doesn't care about my tax, the bank wants the debt to be paid in a timely fashion every month. And so the bank doesn't care if that payment shows up from your account, the S Corp, the C Corp, the, the bank doesn't care if grandma sends in a check. The bank wants the payment to be made on time. On a standard loan at one at two me at $1.2 million. I'm going to have to pay $2,028,000 in principal and interest as an S-Corp at a 40.8% tax bracket. And I have to basically earn $1.69 in order to have that arbitrage there. And people go, yes, an S-Corp where I'm personally held, held doing this and I have to make all that money. Whereas if I were to structure this debt so that I could pay it with a C-Corp dollar at 21%, I only have to pay back $1.5 to $4 million. In other words, in a C-Corp, if I'm paying a debt, I have to earn $1.27. If I'm in a 21% C-Corp tax rate, I only have to earn $1.27. And by only having to earn $1.27 over a 25-year period, my principal and interest is only $1.524 million. The difference between these two debts, even though the interest rate was the same, the term was the same, we borrowed the same amount of money, but because of the way in which I service that debt, I will save $505,000 on the life of that loan, which is a 42% efficiency on the debt. Now, don't get me wrong. You go into your CPA and say, hey, we're going to borrow some money. We're going to do this through C Corp. You will be immediately told, oh, it's two layers of tax, it's double tax, uh, you're going to have retained earnings, nobody owns real property in a C-Corp, well, newsflash, before S-Corps came out a little over 40 years ago, everybody was a C-Corp, period. The problem is, people look at a C-Corp and go, well, you've got stuff up in basis issues and death, you've got retained earning issues at death, all of those things. And those are great for people who don't want to have an in-depth conversation about why a C-Corp in many cases is far more powerful than an S-Corp. But just on a $1.2 million debt, I have a 42% tax efficiency. You know what? If I've got a 42% tax efficiency, in other words, extra money to work with, that gives me more money to solve retained earnings, to solve step up and basis issues, to solve. In other words, if I've got a 42% arbitrage on a debt service, just the debt, it opens many more doors. And so when people say, well, step up in basis, I don't care. Well, two layers of tax, it's actually three, I don't care. The issue is the arbitrage and what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah, one one thing I'd like to bring up <clears throat> that, that yep, people have to change their, their thinking is I've caught a lot of people that that think that they can only have one entity. Oh, I, I, I everything I do, active, passive, everything is in one bucket and one business business entity is S corp, or you know, or an, or an LLC filed as a partnership, or or, or S corp, and it flows down to me, it passes through, and everything needs to be in that bucket. And, and they, it, it, common sense is well, again, what am I trying to do? What's What's active? What's passive? I mean, in an active business, do, is there divisions? Is there um, different asset structures? So when you get into multi-entity structuring, again, you have to back into the designs and accommodating what is trying to be accomplished from the very top down of generating gross revenues, all the way down to you taking X salary to reinvesting back in to some other entity. And one of the interesting things, Ed, that, you know, you talk about uh, C-Corps and you and I use more often the term management services organization. I'd like you to kind of expand upon that. And it's basically, uh, uh, you know, C-Corp, like you said, 
might have a negative connotation because of old days that people just default to double taxation and they didn't want to hear anymore. Management services organization is very proactive, very fluid, very accommodating, very flexible in terms of solving these needs. I, I just would state that it's more proactive. So let's let's talk about that. But again, the first thing I want to mention is I, I, don't, I don't have one company. I have a lot of different things and I have a certain type of business structure and they're tied together. And in that, let's also talk about how the entities, okay, they, they all could be in a trust or multiple trusts and they're all protected. And how does it get managed and how do they talk to, to each other? One of the things that I really learned from you in our team, uh, you and Doug and, and, and others is it's not so much the entity, it's the agreements that tie them together. How, how, what is the agreement? All right. Between things. Okay. So let's talk about that. I, I've, I've said enough to tee up. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great tee up. And so here's a good case. I got a call in December of 2022 uh, from a couple just freaking out, looking at the largest tax liability of their lives. It was, it was a big one. Um, they have four S corporations, bunch of employees. They have four LLCs and a C corp that was basically doing nothing. Their CPA had retired a few years earlier. They moved to big ticket CPA firm where they became a number. Uh, they just weren't getting the personal attention anymore. And they were freaking out about this tax bill. By the way, extremely educated people, uh, one with a PhD, one with a master's in finance. And uh, so so these aren't dumb people. They're, they're very smart, lots of employees. And so they were crying about this big tax bill. And so I kind of talked them off the ledge and said, okay, here's some things we can do. And here's some things that can give you some relief. But in the conversation, I started asking some questions about all their employees. And they're like, yeah, you know, we've got these 4S corporations. And I started saying, well, what happens when you need, you know, people move from this organization? Well, we just, we just retask them. And I'm like, what do you mean you retask them? Well, when we need help over here, we just have these employees over here go over there. I'm like, okay, so corporation one, two, three, and four, you just share the employees. Yes. And I said, so how do they get paid? Well, we don't change their pay or anything. They still get paid. I said, yeah, but how do they get paid on the books? Well, we just track their hours. And I said, so if you got an employee under corporation number two, who's been loaned to corporation number one, how do you separate those times? Do you cut them two checks? That's, that's too much of a waste of time and money. There's no sense in cutting two checks because they work for corporation number two. They don't work for corporation number one. Oh, remember PhD and masters. And I said, you guys, you do realize that when you take employee from business number two and have them work in business number one, and you don't have anything that shows how you're separating this time, how you're compensating expenses, payroll, et cetera, you do realize you have just pierced your corporate veil. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, in the litigation world, we call this the era of operation, era of operation. And I will tell you that over 90% of the time when I start working with a family that has multiple business entities with employees, they are violating the error of, of operation rule, which means that if you ever get in a boo-boo where some plaintiff's attorney is after you, and it is a business-related claim, and they have a good enough CPA firm that can do the forensic accounting to show that you're sharing employees willy-nilly, but you're not sharing the expenses and the allocation of funds appropriately because you shared that employee or a truck or expenses or materials or whatever, you just draw the line right there. Any good lawyer with any good forensic accounting is going to find you pierce the corporate veil, which means they'll go right to the judge and say, Your Honor, they have violated their corporate veil. Therefore, we want this judgment to be spread across all of these business entities. These yep. folks <laughs> turned white when I walked them through what the definition was of an error of operation. And so we went from a horrible tax scenario into how do we mitigate the tax scenario into moving forward, we have to start cleaning up some of your internal operations by having a management services agreement with your management services organization. Whether you are all S-Corps or LLCs or Cs or whatever, 
the minute you're moving resources between things, commonly shared resources, you have to be able to properly document those things. And this is where our attorneys, and yeah, we hate talking to the attorneys, it's billable time, et cetera. But I got to tell you, spending a few bucks on a lawyer now to do things right versus tens of thousands of dollars and time and agony and litigation, it, it's just not worth doing that. You, so, you, you know, Ed, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, you know, I, we know, you and I know just a god awful amount of attorneys. And of course, we filtered through um, and gotten to all the good ones. And it's interesting that, that they have a really difficult time selling their value. And I think you and I are way better advocates for these guys because we're disruptors. You know, I, I, I've told the audience, we're kind of this fox in the hen house and we see everything filtered down on a very basic level, like you're talking about. We won't fund a business entity inside a trust, okay, any trust, even revocable, unless it's proven up. And we audit it, and not an IRS audit, but a, a productive audit. And I just had a conversation yesterday. Where's your shareholders agreement? We can't find it, okay? So they've got to redo the whole agreement. And they've got to do corporate minutes on all the transactions that have ever occurred. And again, you and I won't touch that with a 10-foot pole, but we also help clients identify that error, get back on track, fortify the castle, and then we can do our good work. But again, the people out there need to know that they need to clean house, okay? So continue on. This is a great conversation uh, on all levels, on a very basic level for our clients that are smaller and want to get to the next level. And even for the most advanced, I guarantee you, if we were to get a hold of it, we could find and poke holes in it, just like you said, that the, that the bad guys, if we put on our bad guy hat, we could figure out how to get in the door, and then we inventory that, and we checklist through it, and then we button up everything. We lock down the ship, okay? So um, let's see, uh, where, where do, would you want to go next in terms of, we talked about the business loans and how we're going to make money there using using uh, the tax arbitrage. Um what other uses could you do for within the multi multi corporate structure? Well, so let's say that that we have the client making two million bucks a year. Uh, we restructure what they're doing because they meet the requirements. They're living conservatively. They have excess monies to help them stop income tax stacking, help them get a better degree of asset protection in place. Uh, to help them start growing their business, to be better qualified to borrow money because now they got more money to work with because they didn't overpay their tax. And now we have an arbitrage system to pay down debt faster. When you start looking at all the things you can do when you stop and take a breath because business owners tell me, Ed, I'm too busy running my business. I ain't got time to talk about that stuff. Okay, so if we were to do just 10 to 15 hours of tax work per year and we saved you $150,000 in tax with a 15-hour investment on your time, you realize that's ten thousand dollars per hour for you, and that's when you start going. What? I said, look, you know, your your job is to grow and increase the value of the business, but you need to spend time on the legal structure, the tax structure. So at least maybe one hour a month, preferably one hour a week, just making certain your house is in order. Because when your house is in order, that allows you to start doing other things like looking at how do I even shelter more money, particularly with a C-Corp. C-Corp is one of mine. And I have to confess, I have to confess, when I went through the system to learn about business and taxation, I was taught C-Corp bad, double, triple tax, never, never do C-Corp. <clears throat> so I'm like, okay, we'll stay S-Corp LLC. And for years, I was just a big fan of that. And then I met with a CPA in New Jersey, a big famous guy. And, um, and his secretary gatekeeper was not going to let me meet with him. But I was passing through town. I'm like, hey, can I at least meet with Howard for a little bit of time? And uh, so finally, you know, I sent her some flowers. And she finally got me on his calendar. We met for coffee. And, uh, and I asked Howard, I said, Howard, you know, what percentage of your clients are S-Corps and what percentage of your clients are C-Corps? And he replied, well, Ed, they all have a C-Corp. Now, this guy is old as Christmas, hearing aids the size of hubcaps. So I figured <laughs> so, so I figured maybe he didn't hear my question properly because I wanted to be prepared for this meeting with this guy. And uh, so I know I kind of restructured the question. I said, you know, Howard, what I'm looking for here is what percentage of your clients have an S-Corp? And what? he said, Ed, all of my clients have a C-Corp because none of them are poor. And so I'm like, okay, maybe I need to go home and then 
look at this thing from a different perspective. And of course, he started talking why. And I'm like, okay, clearly I've been working with poor people my whole life. I've got to help people who make me and to me in a year start thinking more arbitrage issues. Well, you, the, you let me clarify. You've identified something just clear for the audience. So a, a C Corp, okay, would be negative over an S Corp or pass through LLC when you're pulling everything out. Right. Correct. Because that's what you're living off of. Right. Everything if, flows down. But, if you're but, consuming... but the, the second a client then says, well, I'm not spending all that money and I'm getting my ass kicked in taxes. That model has just proven itself. OK, devalued in terms of the pass throughs. And now you need to investigate accruing wealth. And that's the that's the very layman's terms of that. Continue. That is perfect because when your consumption is less than your earnings, that is when you have to step back and start asking some pointed questions. And here's some of the questions that I tell people to ask. When you're working with your trusted advisor that you went to college with, whoever it is, attorney, client, financial planner, whatever, uh, you need to ask them questions. How many C-Corps did you do last year? How many C-Corps are you currently you know, reporting on? Uh, how many charitable trusts are you working with? How many charitable structures have you ever worked with? Instead of going and saying, I'm thinking about getting a C-Corp, what do you think? You're going to get blah, what they think right there. Whereas when you tee things up differently, hey, I'm thinking about doing a charitable trust. How many did you do last year? That will give you the ability to measure the experience of that attorney, accountant, financial planner to have a conversation versus just say, hey, I'm thinking about doing a charitable trust or C-Corp. Uh, you're going to immediately get their opinion on it. Whereas what you really want to know is I'm about to ask a question to this advisor. I first need to know, do they have any experience with whatever it is that I'm about to bring to the table? So you've got to think about how to structure your question to the professional advisor. But the C-Corp, to me, when you start having earnings, and of course, you need to have earnings north of a million bucks. Uh, this is not for somebody who has you know total earnings or $100,000 a year. You probably need to be an S or an LLC. But once you start getting earnings of a million bucks and your consumption is less than four or five hundred thousand dollars, there's going to be a hundred to two hundred thousand dollar arbitrage opportunity here for you to start doing some more creative things that can allow you to get to your wealth goals faster and allows you to do some other things. Because the reason I love a C Corp on a business exit strategy, because most of the work I do is transactional. When I sell my S Corp business, and even though I've got a parallel C corporation working with it, I'm selling my S-Corp either as an asset sale or a stock sale. And yes, 70% of the time it's an asset sale, 30% of the time it's a stock sale. But I'm not selling the C. And so what happens is the owner sells the S-Corporation, the assets, et cetera. The business is now in the hands of the buyer. The C-Corp is still sitting there. And one of the things I get from business owners when they sell their S-Corporation they go a year and a half later, oh my gosh, my, my health care rates went through the roof. We don't have anything for deductions anymore. We have no business structure. I mean, they all get upset. And this is another reason why I like a C-Corp to be the management service organization, because as I sell restaurant one or restaurant two or, or hotel number one or whatever, as I sell those assets that have helped me create and accumulate my wealth, I still have that C-Corp entity to go forward. And the C-Corp can continue going after I'm dead and gone. So well, that, really... that gets into our legacy planning, right? Is is uh, it, when you have a business and the business is really running the state, whether they're active or passive assets, and you're continuing on to the next generation, it, it has a, a whole slew of benefits, okay? Let alone just trying to empower and educate your legacy to make sure that they don't ruin themselves it should be in a business format, in my opinion. Okay. Um, but yeah, like uh, some of the things that, that people don't know, like I, I have a MERP, okay, medical expense reimbursement plan. The tax benefits I get for having that in a, in a C Corp benefit or a C Corp entity pays for itself just by itself, let yeah. alone anything else. Yeah, because a MERP, you can claim about a $30,000 deduction, cafeteria plan, 10,000 bucks, deferred comp, 300 grand, long-term care is even deductible up to about five grand. You can deduct up to 300,000 of life insurance. Of course, there's some special ways you have to design this stuff. Right. Uh, disability, VIVA, 15 grand, uh, 
you can still do non you know qualified but when you have multiple businesses you still have all those rules of affiliated business rules and stuff like that yes i understand all that but still at the end of the day <laughs> if you save a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand or in some cases millions uh, you have to stop and look at this and you just have to ask the people the great things but getting back to the root of this question one of the one of the things that people forget about they go hey how much money can i put in my 401k and stuff like this once you've got your business structures operating at full capacity with full tax benefits and you still have big tax dollars hitting your tax return don't forget that charitable retirement planning will blow the doors off these cute little 401ks deferred comp defined benefit plans because all those have these caps where you can only put so much in there. Yeah, there's caps for charitable retirement plan, but you'll typically find charitable retirement planning are five to 20 times greater than what you can dump into a 401k or defined benefit. I covered yeah. that in a, an earlier episode that the, you know, having administrated qualified plans for 35 years, they, they just don't do anything for the owners. They need them for their rank and file and, and some, maybe some key executives, but for themselves, we're, we're always about owner only, owner, owner only plans. And, um, Ed, it, we could consider that really an owner only plan, the charitable that could be cast into that bucket. Right. So again, if we don't take care of the owner, the whole house of cards falls and everybody else is out of a job. Right. So, um, hey. let's, we got a few more minutes. What I'd like to do is, is I, I, I told the audience, I, you know, why I'm in this business and something that's extremely close to me is that all this stuff is great. And we're going to help people build their empire by bringing all of our resources in and get, have them get better and stronger and faster and just safer and more peace of mind. That's the bottom line, but it can all go to way if you don't have your estate planning in order to get to that next gen. The corporation's a discussion point. <clears throat> so without getting into detail, Ed, we're going to have a separate episode on this, but go ahead and and quickly dialogue that everything that we help build, you know, and we can prove all these things up through analytics. But when when we forecast what that value is, that can also be saved. Correct. And there are so many ways to address this issue. It's not funny. And you mentioned the the estate plan. I met with a couple this week that's about to have a $35 million windfall. Very frugal people, no children. They're in the mid-60s. They're somewhat philanthropically inclined. And, and they, they called me because their CPA referred them to me because the CPA didn't know what to do with a $35 million windfall. And I'm like, okay. And so as we sat there and talked through the time we had together, which was supposed to be an hour, turned out being two and a half hours. Uh, as we sit there and talk through what's important to them toward the end of the conversation, I asked them, you know, so you've got your house in order as far as your state plan. And they're like, no, I think we need to get a will and a trust too. And, and I was <laughs> yeah. stunned. I'm like, how, how do you, it doesn't, it doesn't stun me anymore. It doesn't stun yeah. me. So, so there are some basic <laughs> that have to be looked at. Uh, there is a difference in a will and a trust. Uh, we all, because the consumer doesn't know there is a difference you know, an eight-page trust is hopefully going to maybe bypass probate on a good day, okay? And and so why does this attorney charge $1,000 for a trust, but this attorney charges $10,000 for a trust? It, it is sometimes the value of the trust because what I look for are a lot of pages in a trust. And the reason I look for a lot of pages in a trust is because that attorney wants to do more than just avoid probate. That attorney wants to give your family the fighting ability for incapacity or death to address tons of things that will possibly never, ever happen to you. But because you have that language expressed in your estate plan, it makes it easier for your trustee to control what's going to happen to your state when you lose capacity or pass away. And so, you know, Ray, you're exactly right. Uh, some of the fundamental things here just have to be done. I tell folks every three to five years, pull that trust out, sit down with your attorney, go through that thing as if you died, both from a distribution scheme, a, a what happens from a business succession plan, which by the way, most people don't have in place. Right. What do we do for key man to make certain the key employees that could be here to run the company, uh, but because we didn't handcuff them properly to the company when I died, because I died too early, because I got eaten up by a dinosaur or whatever, 
And the next thing you know, my multi-million dollar company has no value whatsoever. The key employees are gone. We don't have a succession plan in place. Oh, and by the way, we're going to probate some so some local judge can determine who gets what, when, and how. All this comes together because you, you step up and you build out a team that can make certain you can put your head on your pillow every night and go, my stuff is in order. I'm doing the best I can from a tax mitigation perspective. I have my assets properly protected from creditors and creditors. I'm doing everything possible. And my wealth curve is going to be extraordinary. Yeah. And and as you know, we we force the hand because uh, we have to do reporting on trust. And, and when every one of our clients, we track all the assets and all the entities and all the trust, it, it, we see where the triggers are that need that, that warrant discussion and we, we we force them on the table and we pull in the the, the uh, strategic partners attorneys accountants whoever the team is you yourself so let's let's wrap up talking really quickly about you ed or like like us you're you're, you're fee based in terms of structuring um tell us where can where can clients find you if they want to have these discussions and raise the bar in their work uh, olympustax.com is my website and there's even a mechanism where you can go there and schedule you know a meeting that type of thing uh, my first book tax secrets made simple you can buy that on amazon um, there's multiple videos i have on youtube where i have talked about certain structures many of the lectures i've done across the country are on youtube uh, you can just go there and camp out on things but you know ray you're exactly right you know the most profitable people are the one who spend time reading learning and educating themselves if you're not taking a proactive process in your ownership of your life and your assets uh, by investing in yourself to learn and grow, uh, you're, you're probably not going to learn and grow as well. Well, it's a complex world and not everybody can do it. But uh, the reason that, again, we're doing California Wealth Warriors and you're one of my warriors is because there are a lot of people that want this and they just don't know where to go. And three new clients for us this week that called in and they just need help. And we're going to get them to guys like you. Ed, thanks so much. We're going to have you on multiple times because we have lots to talk about. But I, I, I think what you and I discussed is that the entity structuring component as it relates to the asset protection and the tax is a starting point. We're going to talk about how certain assets have certain characteristics and investments, tax incentive credits and things like that later on. But you, you got to start with the entity buckets first. OK. And again, when we map out clients together, you know, our clients see their global world. They're going to have a lot of entities, more than one. I'm going to tell you guys out there, you're going to have a lot of trust, more than one. And when you get that puzzle figured out, it's efficiency and optimization at its most, meaning wealth maximization. OK. And you're going to keep it. OK. Guaranteed that. Ed, thanks so much, my friend. Bill, um, I know you learned a lot this tour. <laughs> I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> as as every 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 uh episode we're gonna we're gonna learn a ton. Yeah, no, that was great. Ed was a terrific guest. That was actually a really interesting conversation that you had with him. Ray, we know how to get a hold of Ed, but folks listening today to this podcast, if they want to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? Well, we have uh our website trust-cfo.com or trustcfo.com without the dash you can go we have both of those um uh you know linkedin profiles social media we're going to be posting this uh as you well know bill and just we're just trying to get out there to california um it, we're going to we're going to be advocating for our peers here ed um that we entrust in, inherently and in, and in, in a bunch of other people and they all kind of know each other too so the next guy that comes on i guarantee you ed probably knows and has worked with and and again it's it's this club that people can now resource um but go online find out about this stuff like ed said you can go camp out on these things learn it learn about it to your comfort level everybody's different um some people you know are, are, are uh, much faster than others um i'll tell you i met had a client two days ago talk to and he said, I'm ready to engage. And I, I asked him a couple of questions. I said, no, nah, we need to let you still get some education. All right. And actually, Ed, it's it's somebody that you need to talk to. So all good uh, building blocks. There's many more to come. And we'll try to keep tying these things together. And again, you'll hear uh, Ed and myself talking about other hot topics here in the, in the near future here in 24. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you both. 
Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And you know what? I While the folks are still listening, make this easy on yourselves. Hit the subscribe button. That way you don't have to remember when or where you heard this episode. It'll automatically be delivered to you. So you'll get the next episode. You won't miss one. And if you're new to this podcast, go back and listen from the beginning. You don't have to do it in order. You don't have to be obsessive about it. But as you know, you learned here today, and as Ray has said several times, there are things that are mentioned that are referenced earlier. So it's worth your time. In the meantime, I'm Bill Tucker. On behalf of Ray and everybody at Trust CFO, I want to thank you for listening. And I want to remind you that you can go out today and make it a great day or not. It's your choice. Thanks.